this element of uh, the program is framed as keynote dialogue, um, and uh, that's why I uh, want to ask you first uh, a question: whether you have questions uh, regarding each other's talks. Are there uh, some some remark questions you have there? I see Mike has has some, please. One of the criticisms made of uh, various kinds of uh, big data is that you, there are problems if you rely upon just Google users, because obviously most many people don't use Google. And what value you think there is in just using, in your case, Google, rather than all the different search engines and you mash them together, and whether that's an issue which we need to think about. Um, interesting question. Um, I think at this point we haven't really thought about combining data sets from different search engines or providers. Um, and I think that, at least from, from my perspective, because I can still speak in my previous role um, at Twitter, the data sets, for example, that Twitter provides and that Google provides are a bit different because they are based on different user behaviors. So for example, um, Twitter uses express their opinion, they express their emotions um, on Twitter. Users that go to Google to search um, are following a much more honest way to express their thinking. Because I would never go uh, or log into my Twitter account and ask, like, who's Donald Trump? I would never do that because I would embarrass myself in, fo in front of my followers or friends on Facebook. But I do that on Google. Um, and so the data sets uh, that uh, any company provides or can provide for journalists and academics are definitely different. So it would be interesting to um, actually look at those different data sets and, and combine them. Um, and I think there is an opportunity, especially around um, elections, yeah. to, to see and to, 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 to double check if there is a similarity or Correlation. Yeah. You have a question as well? Maybe? Yes, I do have mm -hmm. a question. Um, so, <laughs> so you, you mentioned that there is um, a shift in not only sociological... It's a difficult word. Uh, in academics, um, towards data-driven yeah. research. How difficult do you find it to find the right data sets or the compelling mm. data sets? And um, what is there that you would wish? Yes. I, th I think that's a very, um, that, that, that is one of the key questions, I think, for social scientists who, who do want to use these kinds of new data sources. Um, and the answer is not straightforward. I'll give you an example of a project which I, I I'm was very keen to, to become involved with, which is one of, my, one of my interests is inequality, but also how inequality affects consumption and cultural activity and lifestyles. And I've done various surveys on this. Of course, surveys, you know, only a few thousand people, and they don't give you much detail. We do know that in the British context, um, one of the most interesting data sets you can have on this is, the, is a data set which is assembled by our supermarket, Tesco. With their, with their loyalty card, which records every single purchase. And it's a very interesting story that Tesco became the dominant uh, retail supermarket in Britain because they were the first to do this and develop this database, which they then subcontracted to a, a market research company, which they actually owned. And this allowed them to have real world analysis of what, what was selling in their shops. And so they were, this is tw 20 years ago, they were the first supermarkets to be able to look at trends immediately. So it helped them to, to plan. Academics would love to have that data set and love to be able to say, can we use this to look at um, you know, social classes, certain classes liking certain kinds of products. Getting access to that data has been proved extremely difficult. Tesco even funded a research centre at the University of Manchester. Um, and there was talk about, oh yes, we might give you a bit of access, but it, was, it proved really, really hard. And, um, so, uh, I mean, I think there is an issue really about kind of private sector companies. And I also think that there are issues of ethics, because I think most people who have a Tesco car don't really realise. I mean, they obviously tick the box, 
when they got the car, but they don't really realise this data is being used. And I think, in a way, <laughs> we should make a public claim that actually um, this material should be in more in the public domain. Clearly, not necessarily in a commercially commercial sensitive way. So there might be a time there might be a time uh, bar on it. But I think you know, it is it is at one level shocking that we are seeing huge amount of data generated, which could actually be used for all sorts of really important questions. But actually. Um, Google's a bit different, obviously, because you're not, you're not operating like a supermarket. But certainly in the case of Tesco, it's, um, it, it, it is, it's a great shame at one level. This data is this is kind of lying on the shelf. Um, which, if I can ask another question, yeah. Um, but, that was a bit, but let me pursue that example of the Tesco critic of the Tesco card and what you could do with it. Because one of the one of the criticisms made of that kind of work, I mean, we, we never got access to the database, but um, in, if we think through the principles and if we think through some examples of something similar, some critics of big data would say, well, what you can do on that is you can kind of infer certain kinds of social characteristics, but you, c you don't really know much about the individuals because a Tesco card has your address, um, they may have your age, but that's all. They don't know anything about your job directly. Um, so, you, so for instance, to go back to your Google, you, you presumably you, you can't tell that doctors like do these kinds of searches and um, lorry drivers do other kinds of searches. And one of the arguments would be that limits your kind of analytical power. Yeah, of course. Um, the the data that you um, can have access to at Google at the Google Trends site, for example is um, anonymous data um, and um, I think of course there are that, that's why it, it would be interesting to combine data sets um, and if other companies like Tesco and your example um, would provide that data in an anonymous way then combining that data would definitely give a much broader and much bigger and more concise um, picture or accurate picture um, the, the, the question would be, um, also from, from my side again, um, do you think that in order to change the perception on big data um, from a scientific, academic point of view, um, there, has to be, there have to be more examples on how impactful research based on big data can be? Or, yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I think, I think that's how social science moves on, is to see researchers using a new method or a new kind of data source to say something fundamentally new. And as I was saying, Piketty is, I think, he, he is now an exemplar, but he, and, and he is using taxation data, which is a particular kind of public, if you like, big data. So we haven't really seen an example, I don't think, from the more commercial world, um, for the, partly in terms of the access issues, which we've been talking about. Um, and that would be that would be interesting. I mean, I'm very struck by, um, you know, we can see these fantastic uh, visuals of people carrying their mobile pho phones around Manhattan and people moving around the city. Um, and it is beautiful to watch, but you can't think, well, and what do we what do we actually learn? If people move around the city and they have these pathways from their home to the workplace. But um, I think we still struggle a bit to find a, way, a good analytical way of of uh, knowing how to use that for for good social scientific purposes. I mean, I'm very keen to, to do that, but I think we still need to do more work. Mm. Okay. Um, one, one comment yeah, okay. maybe. It's good to see that it's <laughs> running on its own, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to... We don't want to exclude you, no. No, 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 no. Just, just ask, and then I have a question <laughs> for, for Mike as well. But please. I just wanted to make one comment on, on your point. Um, and this just uh, was launched today, a really interesting project um, from uh, the uh, Berliner Morgenpost who um, got access to, I don't know the exact data set that they got access to, but it was a data set um, by the, um, I think, committee of, or department of um, city development um, or urbanization. And they created really beautiful maps um, on how Berlin changed over the past years, since 1990. Um, and you, you don't have to be a Berliner or you don't have to know Berlin quite well, but what you could see is based on data um, uh, and based on data that was uh, made available, um, how the city changes and how different 
suburbs changed over time tremendously. Um, and of course, if you look at the visualization um, and you don't read the text below or, or uh, on top of it, uh, you might think, well, beautiful map, that's nice, um, but I don't really understand the, the, uh, the context of it. So um, in that way, it was um, made in a really, really nice way um, where journalists and data specialists work together. Um, so, and that was ki the kind of data that uh, also for academics um, would be interesting. Um, great, and I see that uh, both of you see a lot of potential in, in um, uh, doing analysis on big data, but uh, I have some question marks still, I must confess, and, and one is uh, coming back to uh, the presentation of you, Mike, and at the beginning I had the impression, and you used the term, I think, uh, that it is a tool, um, but later on there was this bullet point saying that uh, it is more important to uh, focus on these uh, sense that lies in the data itself than the um, theoretical framing, the philosophical narratives and things like that. And that uh, isn't that a contradiction? Don't we need still the theoretical approach and things like that um, to come uh, to, to see the question? And that is the question we address uh, to the data set. Um, is there a, a contradiction in there? Um, I'm not sure if it's a contradiction or, or a certain uh, different emphasis. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, and I think data doesn't speak for itself. That's, that's a cu crucial point. And the more data is, the less it speaks for itself because the, just the complexity of it becomes so overwhelming. Um, so you do need theory, absolutely. I think, but it's how you, ma how you make the theoretical points and how you establish your theoretical argument. And so I think the way that Piketty does it or Wilkinson and Pickett do it are by assembling these visuals. So you're not, your theory isn't proceeding by reference back to philosophical you know, a priori, it's, it's, being, it's being done in a more inductive way in dialogue with the data. How it. Yeah. Isn't there a risk in there? Because uh, uh, maybe the data set is now dictating what uh, uh, academics find interesting. I have a data set, I see when I apply this kind of, of uh, analysis to this data set, there comes a beautiful U uh, curve, and uh, that's why I draft this article, not because I see a phenomenon that I don't understand or things like that. No? You're absolutely right. I think, I think there is that danger, and it's become a new empiricism. Of, uh, but. And I think you might, I mean, so I think of those three studies I talked about, the most criticised is Wilkinson and Pickett. Um, and e epidemiologists, many of them feel they've misrepresented, misrepresented data sets and they've, in a sense, they've, they've, they have a very strong argument they want to make and they're just deliberately trying to manipulate some of the evidence to support it. Um, and I think the thing about Wilkinson and Pickett is out of the three thinkers I talked about, they are the ones who are least kind of um, critical of data itself. Whereas Piketty, for instance, um, and obviously, absolutely, it is the case that he would be, um, his, his arguments are dependent upon the data sources, and even income tax data is clearly not perfect because many people don't declare, declare tax. But the interesting thing about him, and I, I talked to him recently when he visited London, is he's very aware that data is constructed. And so at one level, he, he keeps a step back from data. Uh, and he's always asking the question, well, you know, why do these things get measured in this way and not that way? So uh, he is using data to make his arguments, but he's using it in a way which he's also standing back from it, and that also allows him to recognise, I think, some of the absences, which it might be. Mm. I see. And I think also to that point, I think it's two, two ways. Um, so you could have a really compelling data set, and then you dive deeper into it, and you find a really interesting story that you can then um, elaborate on and, and write on. Um, it and sometimes it can be the case that you have a fantastic idea um, and a, f a fantastic story in your mind that you uh, want to base on data and you find data sets that are not working well mm -hmm. with that story. Yeah. So I think um, that's, uh, that it's not always um, based only on the, on the data set and you start with the data set. Mm -hmm. It's two ways. Okay, I see. Um, Coming to, to the data sets uh, you are interested in and um, the, the news lab idea, um, we all know that at least in Germany um, there's not uh, only friendship between publishers, journalists and Google, um, uh, to put it mildly. Um, how 
is your experience as regards cooperation with journalists and, and publishers? Do they really uh, um, want this tool? Do they make use of it? Uh, is there a real dialogue or is it more like a selling process? Or what is it like? I mean, I've been with Google for five weeks. Um, <laughs> um, so starting with that. Um, now, and, and uh, that said, um, long before I joined, there was a strong relationship and, of course, open dialogue between Google and publishers. Um, and in April, we launched this digital news initiative uh, where eight publishers from around Europe uh, and Google worked together to really drive innovation and think about, for example, products that can be um, supportive um, for the entire media landscape in Europe. So the Digital News Initiative is exactly that step to deepen the relationships and to deepen the talks with publishers. Um, they, the, this group of, of publishers and together with Google, they even launched already a product that is available. It's called Accelerated Mobile Pages. Um, it's an open source product um, aiming to increase the speed of web pages and mobile pages. Um, so it's not only about Google tools or Google products. Um, this is really open to everyone. And then secondly, um, there's this innovation fund where Google uh, and together with publishers uh, want to um, drive innovation in the startup ecosystem. And then thirdly, there's a news lab uh, where we come in. Um, and we, of course, want to collaborate with journalists and give them access to the tools, give them access to, um, to, to Google Trends data. Um, and the real rea reaction so far in the f five weeks I've been here uh, are very, very positive. Um, and they're interested in, in, in learning more uh, about uh, tools, trends, etc. Are you open to, to um, um, collect the ideas and put it into new uh, products and analytic tools or is it just uh, uh, that you give access to tools that you have designed and that are um, uh, available? No, so the, the news lab, um, at least I can sp speak for the news lab, the news lab started um, with really a listening tour, spending a lot of time in newsrooms and asking journalists what do you want? Like, what do you need to do your day-to-day -day job? Um, and so it's not only about collecting ideas and then nothing happens. Um, even tomorrow, uh, so it's about, it's about really working together and collaborating. And even tomorrow we have around 200 um, publishers from around Europe in Berlin um, to discuss the challenges of media and uh, also the solutions that we can work on together. Um, I come back to, to this narrative of, of uh, uh, this big data analysis being a tool. And a tool, of course, is a marvelous thing. You can do things with tools uh, you can't do with your bare hands, but tools come with affordances. If you only have a hammer, then you are uh, inclined to, to do things with nails, by, uh, to take this example. And, uh, um, doesn't that mean, uh, we talk about power shifts here, that those who own the data and create the, the uh, analytic frames um, get a little bit of power over the science in your case and, and the public communication in, in, in your uh, example? Is that something that is discussed uh, uh, with Google and, and others and in the academic sphere? I th that's, that's, uh, you're absolutely right. I think that's, that's inherent power bias towards um uh, in the sense, those who are most en engaged with these kinds of, of, of sources will mean that there's a danger that certain kinds of people just are outside the frame of reference. And in the sense, the more powerful you are, the more likely you are to be um, part of this world of big data. So there is, a, and I think you see that very much in a way, in a way with the world of Twitter. You know that people who are tweeting a lot be, are more visible. Well, I was involved actually. I didn't didn't talk about it today, but just this week in the Britain, we we published a book. Um, on, uh, we were involved in a project with the BBC called the Great British Class Survey, which was a big web survey of um, people's attitudes towards social class. And it was not a public interest, lots and lots of discussion. Interestingly, because it was a form of big data, it was a digital web survey and a very large response rate. 
So it wouldn't have been as much interest if it had been a normal survey, but this was a very large BBC survey, and it got a lot of interest. But and this is the this is the this is the kind of difficult issue. Um, if you were at the bottom, in the lower classes, if you were kind of what we call the precariat, which is people on insecure jobs, not earning much, you just did not do it. You would not go to the BBC website to do this quiz because you didn't think it was for someone like you. Um, and then, on the other hand, if you were earning lots and lots of money and uh, been to an elite university, you were really very likely to do it. So you had a hugely skewed sample, and basically the more, the more money you earned and the higher educated you were, the more likely you were to do it. So uh, we, know, I mean, and we knew we realised that at the beginning, so we deliberately didn't use that as a, as a representative survey, but it does make, pose that challenge. I think the way to address that challenge, to go back to what we were saying earlier on, is to mash up different data set sources. And also, in our case, what we did is we did some uh, ethnographic work with the people who didn't do the survey. Um, to the sense, kind of look at, look at the why they weren't doing the survey and what the issues were there. So you can, you know, I think you can get around it, but you absolutely need to be very careful in looking at the absences and the biases in the, in the survey, in the, in the data. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Something you want to add? Mm. Okay, if that's not the case, then um, I will open up uh, for questions now that we have, on, that we have enough uh, time to, um, to do that. Uh, please be kind enough to use the microphone and uh, maybe stand up that people can see you and uh, just uh, give your name. Hi. Thanks very much. I'm always a bit nervous, so it might be that the mic shakes. Um, my name is Zelda Aslan. Thank you for your talks. I'm from Mannheim University. And I wanted to stress a point that uh, Mike has just mentioned before about the ethics. Um, I was wondering, you know, if I do research, I ask people, do you want to participate in my research? And uh, usually I only take them if they say yes. So, and normally they get money for it or chocolate or something else. Um, and um, I was wondering, about the data that you suggested that we should use, the big data from administrative uh, places, that is basically state surveillance, or from um, Google, which is a company that exploits their users to gain profit. Um, I was wondering, where do we, do we really want to use this data, just because it's there? And if yes, where do we stop? Like if the NSA comes across and says, hey, we have so much data, don't you want to find out more about society? Are we going to say, yes, <laughs> so interesting, um, we should. And they probably have nice visualiza visualizations too. So I was wondering, where, where do we stop? And do we really want to have this kind of data? Or do, is there something like a codex of, um, I don't know, fair data, something? Some some ideas on that is there um, an ethical yeah. discussion going on? Uh, in absolutely, the UK? There is, ab absolutely there is. And you're, you're absolutely right. The ethical issues are huge, and um, uh, the, 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 uh, there's no easy solution to them. I think the issue of informed consent. I mean, it's most most of the conventional social science interview and surveys use, use informed consent as the kind of gold standard, and people not only have to give consent, but you need to explain it very carefully, and then you need to understand what's involved in informed consent. That just does not happen in uh, most forms of digital data. I mean, people don't realise when they're using the Google searches that the stuff is going to be analysed. Um, but of course, if you want, you know, these days you need to use the internet to access, to, 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 send, to do routine things. So in a way, just saying, well, I don't want to tick the box. But if you do that, you, you, you are denying yourself lots of uh, possible ways of accessing services. So in a way, you know, we, have, we have no choice really but to do these sort of things. And, uh, but I would, um, so I think there are really serious issues around that. But I also do think that, um, you know, there's no such thing as any kind of research which doesn't pose ethical issues. And I, um, from where I'm sitting, I'm really interested in kind of how we get at the, the, the perpetuation of privilege and power. And that people in power often don't want to be interviewed, and they wouldn't do these informed consent interviews all the time. And this, in a way, is Piketty's you know, contribution. He's, he's put the spotlight on the very wealthy and the very rich by looking at data sources like income tax data. Um, and I think, you know, so I think we do at times, I think I have to think about, well, if you want to ask challenging questions which are addressing really important social scientific issues, um, we do need to think about extending our kind of ethical 
range away from simply saying if people don't want to talk to us, then we just have to leave it, leave it there. Otherwise, that's going to limit, I think, what we can really do. Yeah. Do you want? The, um, the extremely interesting question. We have to see whether we, we put that in our um, uh, efforts uh, with this uh, series here, because it's not only the ethical things you mentioned are not only about data protection and uh, the classical data protection, but the ethical um, uh, way data is gathered and whether it's, it's okay to make use of that. Uh, and when it comes to data protection, if I may talk as a lawyer, then you have the special uh, problem that you can anonymize uh, data in a, in a state-of-the-art way, but you can't be sure that they are analytic, not analytic models that uh, repersonalize these data sets again. And so the traditional instruments of data protection are really challenged as uh, <coughs> regards that. There is a, another question. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. Mm. I'm Stefan Rusmol from the University of Lugano in Switzerland. Um, I think all of the researchers and all of the journalists in the, in, the, in the room know that you can play with data and you can manipulate. And I think all of us also know that large and powerful companies, beginning with Volkswagen in Germany or with Exxon in the United States, concerning data about climate change or talking about the cigarette industry, we all know that they have used data very selectively and manipulated in their own interest. Now, my question is, if Google and Facebook uh, and other players are becoming similarly or even more powerful with all the data they have, isn't there a danger that they will also manipulate all of us by presenting very selectively uh, data which you have and uh, well you will present those data to us which help you for your business interests and you will possibly withhold those data which uh, don't serve your business interests and now you are even co-opting some of the most powerful media companies who should be your watchdogs <laughs> and uh, they become part of the digital news initiative and cooperate with you. Isn't that something, well, which shouldn't only frighten young researchers from uh, London, but maybe all of us here and elsewhere? <laughs> comment on that? Okay, uh, I mean I can only comment uh, on that from someone who just joined Google of course five weeks ago and I stress that again. Um, so I can only speak from a news lab perspective. Um, the, the, the data that the Google News Lab team provides and gives access to is um, of course open to everyone um, and we not select because of a business interest, but because of a uh, editorial interest. So um, if you go to the GitHub page of, uh, of, of the Trends team, for example, you see a various collection of data sets um, that range from football to polit politics to science to um, lifestyle issues. Um, and there's certainly no limitation to that or no filter to that. Um, so from, from a news lab perspective, um, I think it's important um, to stress again that we provide the data, um, but it's the journalist or the um, academic um, researcher who puts that data into, into context. Thanks. Um, my name is Lena, Lena Olbricht. I'm from Social Science Research Center, and I have two questions for each of you. Uh, one is for uh, Isabel. Um, let's say, well, there is some mistrust in the data you provide, but once we agree that you provide the full data you have, I'm still interested in how academics and journalists can use it. The traditional data set um, was provided somehow in a transparent way. I had a code book where I could read, you know, the operation, operationalization of variables. I could read the whole process of how the data was collected and so on. Now I'm interested in the data you provide, for example, about Google search. Do you also provide research about how the data is generated? Do you do research on 
under what conditions people use Google, when do they use Google, what does it mean when they ask Google questions. For example, you gave the Donald Trump example. When I, look, when I search Donald Trump, does it mean that I'm in support of Donald Trump? Does it just mean that I'm somehow fascinated? Does it mean that I have no clue about who he is? Does it mean I want to see pictures and mark his hair? So how much do you know about how the data is generated? Because that means a lot to how we can interpret it afterwards. Um, and if you do research about the context in which data is generated, do you provide it to the public? And my question to Mike comes a little bit back to the question you asked in when you published your paper in 2007. Um, you you um, were interested in what does big data mean for the development of social science and uh, now you've discovered that social science uses big data. Some people say that the big data hype is also an instrument of researchers just to gain funding. They, use, uh, they claim they do big data because they know it's just the way you get funding nowadays. So I'd really like to know what do you think on whose expense is the expansion of big data? The traditional statistics in sociology, the classical surveys, or more the qualitative research? Thanks very much. Challenging questions. So we'll start. Okay. I'm going to start. Um, good, good question and, and really interesting question. And. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the time where um, the team, and that's again prior to my, my joining the team, um, where there was no dedicated site, um, to no dedicated t Google Trends site, uh, where you can actually um, see trending stories or explore uh, trends um, or explore topics um, uh, based on search. And there was also no team who was working with journalists and academics. Um, so the two ways we uh, work now with journalists and academics is, uh, one, we provide raw data and give, of course, context what the raw data set means. And second, we collaborate with uh, journalists and academics. Um, and you saw all these examples, um, for example, the, the Mashable example. Um, Meshable approached the team and, um, and, and asked them if Google would have data um, visualization capacities to help them to drive that story around um, the Nepal earthquake. So, um, but it's a good point and I think I of course have to double check again with the team um, whether we plan to give more context um, if we want to collaborate with journalists and academics. Um, but I think the goal, and Simon Rogers is leading that team, the goal is of course um, that we provide the context and give more information around um, what, what it does mean if you search for, for Donald Trump, if you like his hair or if you're just interested in if he's attending the GOP debate. So definitely I'm taking, I, I'm taking up your point. Um, Almost likely that you are interested in his last rant uh, at some show or something like that. And please. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I think we're in a very, very uh, fascinating time for methods and, and social science. And, and there's different tendencies at work, different, you know, some of them linked to big data, some of them not really that directly linked to big data. So in terms of the challenge to existing methods, I mean, my, my view would be, what's, it may be different in Germany, but in, in the UK, I think uh, the, s the sample survey, which is a kind of you know very widely used, and also as is used by um, market research companies, you know, there's there's real challenges to that. We saw it in the recent election in Britain when they well, they all got the results completely wrong. Um, and this issue is partly about you know if you're using phone if you're doing phone interviews, people don't use the phone anymore. If you use mobile phones, that's also skewed. People aren't at home. So the response rates are falling. I think what it, what it doesn't mean the doesn't mean the sample survey will decline entirely. I think what, what is happening is, uh, and it's actually happening in the UK, is that there's funding for the really big, prestige, high prestige surveys, the panel surveys particularly, the peak ones, where people in a sense are invested into it and they will carry on doing it year by year because they feel they have to or feel they should do. But it's more difficult to get funding for a bespoke, you know, one-off survey these days. So I think it's the, the, the big major surveys will, will carry on. But this, you know, the, the more uh, 
one-off surveys will are going to fade away. I do think the, the, the in-depth interview, which has been a major method in Britain, is looking really p quite problematic because um, we are so saturated by interviews and my people are so used to interviews. And it, it's actually a really interesting piece by um, the American sociologist Seamus Khan about you know, what you get in interviews is, is accounts. And people are very skilled at giving accounts. And uh, obviously it depends on your background and your cultural capital, but nonetheless you get accounts. But how that maps onto practice is problematic. So I think those, I think that those two are in, are in difficulty. I, on the other hand, I think ethnography, the old, old style in, intensive immersion in a neighborhood or organization is actually very, still very strong, possibly getting stronger because um, it's an act actually an extremely good complement to looking at big data because you can actually see how it is being deployed and interpreted mm -hmm. in particular contexts. So my sense is um, some qualitative methods, particularly ethnic, ethnographic ones, are probably getting a bit of a resurgence, but the in-depth interview at, by itself is declining. Um, and I, th you know, I, I, I think that the um, I, I do think the use of administrative data, taxation data, is going to be very interesting to watch. We had this big debate in the UK about whether we need to carry on with the census, which we've had every ten years for the last two hundred years. And there was one argument saying we don't need to do it anymore because we can just link together all the all the government departments' records, and that's much easier and much cheaper. In fact, they are keeping it going to twenty twenty one, but it's, that's, that debate is going to be had again. Thanks very much. Um, I've seen um, um, three hands up, um, and um, we have time for one question, I guess, um, <laughs> uh, and the final remarks. I'm, I'm very sorry. I saw that you have uh, raised your hand here, but you have the opportunity after that uh, to talk with the panelists. So uh, please, this question and then a brief um, final concluding remark from your side, and then... Uh, we have to finish, please. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Ulrike Klinger. I'm from the University of Zurich, also Switzerland. And I thank you both for your very interesting presentations. Um, and I, I totally get the point of telling stories and about, about the power of visualizations. However, I have to take up a point that our American colleague Rod Benson stressed at the ICA in Seattle two years ago, um, when what he called uh, new descriptivism. If we all go in this direction, and if we all do that, you know, take those sets and do nice visualizations, then I wonder what happens to explanation? And maybe, continuing on that, what happens to critical research? So maybe you could say something about that. Thank you. Thanks for the question. And actually, I was in Zurich yesterday. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, great question, and um, I, th I hope I made the point that um, by showing beautiful visualizations, not only the Nepal example <laughs> or the climate change uh, example or um, any other example, um, the data and the visualization is not enough. Um, because we might be all experts in a way that we are able to understand um, uh, bits and pieces of those visualizations, but definitely not the entire picture. Um, and if you then imagine that um, a much bigger audience sees those visualizations embedded in a news article, and of course they have no idea what they see there. So I think, um, and you make the point, uh, I think it's extremely important to still have that context and to analyze uh, those data sets and those visualizations in that context. And um, I, I, I I can't believe that any journalist or data-focused journalist who's using data um, to, to innovate or to drive innovation and storytelling um, is only focusing on the data set. Um, they will still do their investigative job and they will st still do their research job, which I think is absolutely crucial. Um, and yeah, and I think you, you make the point yourself, um, and uh, I haven't seen um, data stories that were lacking any description and any analysis. Um, I'm, very, I'm very interested in the debate about description and explanation, I think, and I think there's all sorts of ways of addressing it um, by, by thinking about what you know, different models of causality and different descriptive strategies, but 
Um, on the point you specifically made about um, being critical, I think being critical, I mean, where we can discuss what we m might mean by being critical, but actually, actually, I think there is one very important way in which being descriptive it allows you to be critical, and I think comes out very well in the workers and the picket and the and the pickety, is if what is if what you're doing descriptively is to uh, is to array a series of comparisons, say the different nations of the world, and you rate their health and your their income, you can use that to kind of put, pull out the contingency of particular cases, and say, well, why is it the case that the U.S., which is the wealthiest country in the world, um, has you know, poorest health rates and things like that? So actually. Description done well allows you to be very critical, I think, and it's because it's the same. I mean, by arraying trends of income inequality over time, you can actually say, well, what, how is it in 2015 we are returning to the uh, aristocratic order of, of Europe before the First World War? So it's, a, it's a pretty descriptive point, but it's, I think, a very critical point. And um, I actually find that this is perhaps an argument we can have later, or discussion we can have later. Uh, when people say, uh, we must not lose sight of explanation. That sounds fine, but there aren't actually that many, it seems to me, really good explanations of things in social science, um, you know, which are either very reductive, you know, it's all to do with capitalism, uh, for instance, or fairly tautologically obvious. And um, perhaps, perhaps you've got some, but <laughs> I, th I think it's the, the thing about explanation is often weird out. It sounds good, but I'm, I'm, in practice, I'm, I'm not sure if it is such a, such a powerful... Valley and Koi. Thanks very much. Um, only very, very few uh, concluding and technical uh, remarks, but very important ones at the end. Uh, the first one, a big thank you to our speakers. We were really fascinating, and I think it's uh, worth clapping our hands uh, for <laughs> these um, fascinating <laughs> remarks. Um, thanks very much indeed. Um, thank you to the British Embassy, of course, uh, which has been an excellent host here and uh, could be in this marvelous rooms, to the Vodafone Institute, uh, which makes this possible and is an excellent partner in, in uh, doing this. Um, thanks very much. Uh, and our organizational team, of course, uh, Lena Ulbricht, uh, Christian Petzold and Larissa Wunderlich. Thanks very much. Uh, it ran extremely smoothly. I'm uh, also thankful to the... Um, uh, two speakers of the um, divisions Sociology of Media and Communications and Computer Mediated Communication of the German Association for Communication uh, because they were so, uh, so kind um, uh, to accept that they do not have a room here for a welcome address uh, and leave us more room for discussion. So that's very, very kind. Thanks very much. Uh, this conference is not only the starting point of a lecture series uh, by the Vodafone Institute and uh, our institute, the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, but also for a conference on media and complexity that takes place uh, tomorrow and the day after. Uh, and I hope this conference will be extremely fruitful and uh, um, a welcome to all guests that are part of this um, community. I think that's it basically. Um, I've already talked about the series we have. That means that we hope to welcome you uh, um, to another event. If you have subscribed to our newsletter, we will inform you when they take place. It's uh, in January and March, but the exact date is to be announced. Um, and I think that's the final remark. The last one is uh, the one I like most. I invite you to drinks I don't have to pay for. So uh, <laughs> please, uh, please uh, enjoy the hospitality of the embassy and the talks with the panelists and our team and with each other. Thanks so much. <laughs>